Ramparts of the Trotsky Castle in the Czech Paradise. The year is 1438 or so. Gustav Sof, the robber knight, stands with his sidekick, Schweikar, when a doorbell rings. The robber knight. Remember to address me as Skipper in front of anyone. Schweikar. Skipper? The robber knight. Yes, Skipper. Schweikar. Sure thing, Skipper. Schweikar exits. The robber knight turns to the audience. He is instantly anxious. He turns toward where Svekar went. Damn it. I should have gone. Yes, well, I'm... I think it is customary that when a character is left all alone on a stage like this, that he express some inner truth or deliberate some point having to do with the drama at hand. But that also means more memorization for the actor. God damn it. I know enough not to get myself into positions like this, but, well, here I am. Okay. Deep inner truth or point having to do with the drama. The robber knight thinks. He stops, looks at the audience. Nope, no deep thought. He thinks. He thinks. He begins to fiddle with something on stage. He finds something he doesn't like. He adjusts that. He looks at the audience. Maybe there's someone in the audience he finds attractive. He smiles. He flirts. If he doesn't get a response, he shrugs his shoulders. If he gets a positive response, maybe he goes over, over to the audience member. Finally, Shvekar pushes the little girl in a nice flower print dress onto the stage. The robber knight. Oh, thank goodness. Shvekar, you, you, you didn't do the soliloquy again. The robber knight, that's the last time I'm getting left on this stage alone. What am I supposed to say to these people? Shvekar, an inner truth or some point of deliberation about the drama at hand? The robber knight, I, I never have anything to say. Who is this ruffian? Shvekar, you're a first opponent of the day. Shvekar, points the robber knight glares at the little girl hello everyone my name is sarah edmonds and i'm the editor-in-chief of for page and screen magazine i'm here today with pavel greiner he is the author of the knight the robber knight christoph solve thank you so much for being here today uh thanks for having me it's a real pleasure we're so excited i I was just saying, I love this play so much. Um, could you, you tell us a little bit about it, a little bit about what inspired you to write it? Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. Um, the The truth behind the play um, is, is, is really scary. Maybe now hopeful, I don't know. Uh, but I wrote the play in response to the election of um, uh, Rahm Emanuel, in the, the city of Chicago. Um, and this was um, when he was first running for, for mayor of Chicago. And, and I was living in the city at that time. And, um, you know, the, the sort of politics that he represented even back then to me was um, unimpressive to say the least um he did a he made policy choices that um greatly affected how um chicago uh was shaped as a segregated city and he really knowingly pursued policies that um extended that segregation and exacerbated it, um, you know, to the point where, you know, people complain about Illinois losing lots of citizens, right? What the, the detail they leave out about this is that the people mostly leave, le, leaving uh, the Chicago area, especially are people of color, that and those people are leaving because they are finding that there are other places uh in other parts of the united states uh that are more welcoming to them and where they have family roots of course right because we had the great migration uh, in the 30s, these people have maintained contacts with people in other parts of the United States, right? And um, and so they're going where they feel more 
comfortable. And and the policies that were pursued by um, by uh, um, Rahm Emanuel and the kind of politics that he, the political machine that he came from were not interested in um, really addressing the the root causes of our problems together. I can absolutely, hearing you talk about that, I can absolutely see those themes coming as they come out through the play. They translate very, very well. Um, Do you usually have very politically minded work? Do you have those social justice Uh, themes in your work? Yes, yes, uh, I, I think so. Um, my, I'm, I'm a political activist, um, and I go, you know, way back to the eighties, um, very involved in, um, in political activism. And I do, uh, pursue political, the politicalization of my art. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I recently was listening to an interview with another author. I, Forgive me, I don't remember his name, but he had said that sometimes the best stories, the most Mm -hmm. important stories are the ones that deal with social consciousness and with Mm -hmm. the social issues of the time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important because as a student of literature myself, I know we all are as writers. it, literature has so much to do with society. It's not mm-hmm. just reactionary. It can also be a vehicle for sparking conversations and mm-hmm. change. Um, so I just love that you have those themes in your work and in such an entertaining way as well. Like it's yeah. fun read. This Thank one. you. Yeah. I mean, it's farce, right? So it's high farce. Uh, you know, go, you know, and I certainly, you know, like, um, oh, and now I'm going to forget, like, who wrote, um, uh, you know, g- g- but Greek comedy stuff, right? Um, using those, some of those tropes, right? And then, of course, me- the medieval, um, part of it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very Polish, as I, as I mentioned to you, uh, in our little introduction. And, uh, um, but I'm also a Czechophile. I, I really enjoy, um, Czech culture. Uh, and, um, so I, I actually went to, um, the, uh, FAMU, the, the, the Czech, um, film school, uh, for, for a, a little, uh, stay like a like a six month stay with them um and i uh you know these amazing cinematographers uh taught us about their version of cinematography their their understandings and it was great uh the city was you know is like like not it's it's such a just the place itself is mysterious uh it has all even though it's crowded with tourists and stuff but i the 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 non-touristy parts are the parts that I really enjoyed, um, and uh, and and their response to communism is very different than the Polish response, and so that's always a fun like thing to measure the difference between them. Uh, their similarities are are you know are incredibly. Uh, they're very similar to each other and yet different. And so I learned about the Czech paradise and about Krzysztof Sof. Uh, um, you know, t- just as a tourist in, in the Czech Republic, um, or Czechy as the, as it's now the official line, Czechy. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, that's why I, um, my, my family comes from Silesia. Um, and so Silesia, th- there are Czech parts. There are Silesian Czech part, like Silesian is a cross border identity. Um, and so there are German, um, there are Sile- part of Silesia is in Germany, part of it is in Poland, part of it is in Czechy. Uh, so that that middle European culture is definitely one that I um, attend to, right? And in this, of course, you also have like Ionesco, clearly the absurdist um, element in this, right? Where um, uh, also, you know, Gombrowicz, uh, 
that he's a big hero of mine. Um, and um, I'm translating one of his plays right now. I'm working on a official translation of of the uh, a new one of the the wedding or wedding. Um, I call it wedding. We haven't yet figured out the right title. I know that's weird, but it can be translated in two different ways and both have connotations that are different than the other. Anyways, so yeah, Central European stuff, super influential. Uh, the use of um, uh, um, performative language, right? So um, Gombrowicz uses this a lot where the thing that is said becomes... You know what I mean? Like you, you know, this is now a church, and then it is a church, just like that. And I am the priest, and you are the, and we like, and we go like you just the characters snap into place, right? Just like that. Um, and so then, and and that that performative stuff, um, that performative language, uh, I think informs how how the farce uh happens right with characters saying exactly what what who they are and what they are and what they're doing and then the other character um using that for their own purposes right mm -hmm. absolutely it's fascinating it's a fascinating technique and not honestly not one i'm very familiar with i mm. have not heard of that piece before i i can see it in your play thinking about it now and the influences uh -huh. there, but I, f I feel like I need to do much more research now. Uh, <laughs> you sounds know, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm of course, you know, just, uh, having fun with, with, <laughs> with the piece. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, um, you mentioned film. I know I was scrolling through your IMDb page earlier and you have a pretty impressive filmography. Oh, How did you, you get into that how did you get into that space to movies uh, um uh, well um i think uh cinema has always been a big part of my life um it's um i grew up um when cinema was still very large you know although i'm not like i'm not one of those people you know although i like going to a movie theater a lot you know and um, and it's something I enjoy doing. Um, I'm also not, you know, there's a lot of um, soul searching in the film industry about um, changes in the distribution model of audiovisual stories, right? And the model of the cinema is becoming a... Um, a niche market right it and and it and then there's you know there's the you know the sadness of losing the big screen right uh and how how you used to be able to see movies in these very large uh uh modes but you know those large modes were themselves responses to television and other stressors on the marketplace, right? Uh, and it was these were all market-driven decisions, these aesthetic choices that we now are like so attached to, right? Um, and also, if you harken back all the way to the beginning of of cinema, right? You are talking flip cards right in a nickelodeon so you're looking at this so you're looking at a box about this big right and if you take a look at the iphone you're looking at a box about the same size right this the notion that we have somehow lost touch with cinema th that's not the case the case is we have gone we have what was part of cinema always, which was the you know watching two people kiss, uh, um, uh, people dancing, doing something silly, uh, a kid playing a joke on a um, on a on a guy with a water hose. Do you know that movie? Do you know which movie I'm talking about? 
So if you go back, like literally, it's a joke, right? And I can explain the joke for you, right? Guys gar gardening, right? La, 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 la. Kid walks up behind him, steps on the hose, right? Yeah. Hose stops. Guy looks at the hose. Kid lifts his his foot off the hose. Guy gets splashed in the face, right? Simple, mm -hmm. simple joke. That's a big hit of the of the you know super early cinemas, right? Like the flip cards, uh, and. And if you take a look at what people watch now, like on, on YouTube and whatnot, again, it's literally, you know, it's people falling, people doing st stupid things, you know, two people kissing. It's literally the same content as the Nickelodeon was. Um, you know, what What does that mean about us? I don't know. It just means that, you know, that, that medium is, has now ascended, right, into a position where it used to be inverted, right? So... Um, the the our our audiovisual uh, input was large and collective, and then uh, um, you, you know so it, first it was individual, right? Then it was collective, and now it's more moving into an individualized uh, reception. Is that bad or or good? I haven't. I don't know, you know, like, I mean, clearly the market and aesthetics are different, right? And the things that used to work don't anymore. Um, it, and also, it's not like, you know, they people said, you know, oh, movies will kill off the novel, right? No, they never, they didn't kill, kill off the novel. Actually, they started a whole nother version of selling novels. And the same thing will, is going to happen with, with this, with everything, right? You'll have, um, you'll you'll have cross-platform uh, communication um, about um, a, a certain sort of world that has been created, right? So Star Wars is the clear sort of example of that, right? Where you have it's a world, and then within that world, you have all these different ways of communicating stories out of it, right? Using themes that so it the models there, people are just afraid of change, you know. And that's that's movies right now. My own movies, oh, uh, my own movies are mostly self-funded. Um, I do I have had small grants like through the Haitian American Museum. Um, I worked with them on a movie about um, uh, Polish uh, emigres to Haiti in the early 19th century. So 1804, during the revolution, there was a Polish uh, group that joined the revolution against the French. And so I did a, a short documentary about those, the descendants of those folks. Um, and um, But mostly it's self-funded. And, you know, I'm still uh, sending feature film ideas out and hoping to get something funded someday. That would be amazing. Um, now, when you say they're mostly self-funded, do you write the films and do you plan them differently when you know you're going to be the one directing them than you would if you were sending them out to someone else? Um it depends on the film. Each film is really different. Each, you know, each film um, has a different, completely different trajectory. Um, I can't, I like to write, you know, clearly. Um, and so I have, I, I enjoy the, the activity. So it's not something I run away from. And um, I especially like to write fiction. I especially like to write fiction or anything that will some somebody else will actually read and or see <laughs> that I'm really into. Uh, and um, so, you know, I, I'm slowly sort of creating. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, my, my, it, what, what it is for me, it's a record of my, uh, exploration into that that world of of media making yeah cool i love that i love that um now earlier you were talking 
you're throwing out all of these facts and I love it. I feel like I'm learning so much. Um, but do you often incorporate history and historical events? Yeah. yeah one, one of my, uh, um, Lena Dorado, uh, uh, she was a, a student, a fellow film student, uh, with me at Columbia university. And, uh, one of her, uh, jokes about my scripts was there was, there was always a pig roasting somewhere in it, you know, and not in the sense that I would actually mention pigs roasting, but it's the kind of world in which there's always a roasting pig somewhere. Right. So yeah, super, uh, yeah, history has informed, uh, almost all of my work in some way um and and so does uh some form of social comment about uh some aspect of that yeah yeah and do those elements uh, digging into your writing process here do those elements come first and then you build the story or does the story come first and you find connections that after that yeah, story writing, I'm pretty intuitive about, and I try as much as possible to, uh, to dive into the, the world that my characters inhabit and, and really be in there with them, uh, and explore the possibilities of whatever world they're in. Um, uh, and, and they're, you know, yeah, there the rule making is much more about the characters pursuing their goals, right? And then, yeah, any kind of um, assigning of meaning to it, um, maybe in the editing process, a, a little bit of um, uh, correction, you know. Um, but beyond that, trying to trying to elicit what the text itself is telling me as its own author. I know that sounds bizarre, but that's really kind of the process I try to engage in, right? I try to engage the text as the text and then really like diving into it and then use it as a way to to for it to have internal sense, you know, to have an internal, um uh, uh structure mm -hmm. absolutely i think of something that may or not, may not be a spongebob quote oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where my mind goes um yeah. but i think of sculpting and this idea that the the sculpture this figure is already in there and you just have to uncover it you just have yeah. to chip away at it until you figure it out and right hearing you talk about storytelling it feels very much the same thing you're just uncovering what already is exists it's funny right and then and then you're also the author right which is the it's a you know it's it's playing with your it's playing with with different perspectives within yourself right and how you approach things yeah yeah that I mean that's the fun of it right Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you find that you spend a lot of time in with editing in general, but with making those tweaks and adding those mm -hmm. elements? Uh, some, again, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some things happen in five minutes. You know, you write it and you're like, all right. Mm -hmm. There it is. Like, I don't know how that happened. And then sometimes like, you know, 15 years later, you know, you're like, oh, finally, I figured this line out, right? Like, um, and there, I wish there was a rule to it, you know, and I wish I could like, you know, but I don't, for me, I have not found it. You know, I find um, ideas come when they come and uh, I have to trust that they will, you know, that's something, right? Trust that, that I will come up with a good idea. Um, and, when just just keep having fun with it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a hard thing to do when you are, um, you know, you're tired, you have another job, because clearly writing does not pay. Uh, you know, like, I mean, there are the TV writer 
types and i guess people make money blogging or doing this other stuff i don't know i you know that's just not you know surely in the theater there's no money to be made whatsoever uh and uh performance uh you know again there's like you know there's famous performers but nowadays it's very hard it's very hard at being an actor is i mean it's you know, all these kind of public things very difficult these days uh they've always been difficult to tell you the truth um expectations of success are low but in terms of like monetary or somehow life style changes you know what i mean but but again i'm not complaining about my life my life is i have a very nice life i i work as a uh a manager at the Polish American Association, and uh, I work. The, I manage the the family services department. I work with uh, domestic violence. I work with uh, perpetrators of domestic violence, uh, survivors of domestic violence. I work with people who uh, are seeking um, refuge from addiction. Uh, I work with. Um, I, I run a food pantry, so you know I have uh, I have a wonderful family. Uh, I have a, a beautiful ten year old boy, beautiful wife. You know my life is perfect. I, I you know so the writing part nowadays, um, I think I used to be much more possessive about it all and possessive about my career. Maybe you know like okay, I'm a writer and I'm not you know and clench my teeth and um be disappointed with that i wasn't achieving what i thought i was supposed to achieve uh yeah that you know and then now we can talk about my family again you know go deeper into that but no uh we're, i'm not i'm not going to psychoanalyze myself or, uh, uh, uh for you um what I will say is, yeah, I, you know, nowadays I enjoy the process of, of, of things much more. Um, I, you know, like I've had a couple scripts, um, you know, I've been able to pitch stories to producers um, in, in Poland, in Germany, in France, uh, and just the, just being able to do that is already like has been so much fun right like yeah i get to go to berlin and you know go to film studios and you know talk to somebody about art okay you know like it that's great you know that just doing that is great um and if something comes of it that's even better Absolutely. And you had mentioned earlier you were working on a translation as well. What's it like writing and working in multiple languages? Are there any that are easier or harder? Back mm. Yeah. You know, like like Joseph Conrad, um, uh, you know, who is Polish, Joseph Józef uh, and, you know, he said that, you know, um, I would never, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to butcher what he said, but it's something to the effect that um, Polish is too special a language for me, for, for me to butcher it. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I'm not, and certainly not literary output, right? I think my command of, of the English language and it's, um, uh its literary tropes is is just stronger and and that's because i've lived in the united states but that doesn't you know like like joseph conrad right that doesn't make me any less polish um it just means that i'm writing in a different language and this and this 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 idea you know it's really it's really long lived right so um, so somebody like Czesław Miłosz, right, is a is a he considers considered himself a Lithuanian poet poet writing in Polish, right, and then he considered himself a Lithuanian poet writing in Polish in exile in Berkeley, California, right, and 
for work to be translated almost automatically into English. And, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and even Gombrowicz, right, who, who, whom I'm translating, um, working on uh, an official uh, translation of Schloop, which is, can be either translated into um, wedding or uh, marriage. Uh, the the current the current one is marriage, um, but I am I like wedding much more. Uh, I think it has more to do with the story at hand. Um, but I'm not, you know, there's going to be editors that that take over there. But Gombrowicz, you know, is 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 another fascinating guy, right, who writes in Polish, but because of World War II and then communism, um, spends his life in Argentina, his later life in Argentina. And what what is super interesting, I grew up with Gombrowicz, my, my, my father... Um, uh, whom I told you was was from um, uh, pre-war Poland, right? So it's Poland of the between the two world wars. This is when he came of age uh, in a in an in an upper middle class family with tragedy everywhere. Tr- trust me about the tragedy everywhere. But you know he he also. Uh, then in World War II, he was older, so he's in his twenties. Um, and by the time he went to Britain, he was, you know, mid twenties, late twenties. And so they made him an officer, right, in the British style. So you get like etiquette training, right? You know, like like when you know if you go to Annapolis or if you go to West Point, they they teach them this this sort of etiquette, right? That is, and so he had that. And also um, a connection to Polish literature, very deep. So I, Gombrowicz has always been in my house, uh, you know, books about him. Uh, my mother, I often say, my mother made the mistake of of um, introducing uh, poets as important people to me. <laughs> Boy, was she ever wrong, you know. <laughs> but my mother um, and my father would introduce poets as very important people, uh, and so I grew up with sort of this this literary uh, aspirations sort of built in. And so there, the, you know, in Polish there are Griner, there are writers and. It's actually a name, you know, like the, I have ancestors that that did the same thing I'm doing right now, uh, and you live what I would call, um, you know, you're in between. That's what I am. I'm an in between. I'm also, I think, a modern person, right? Where multiple, uh, multiple jurisdictions have control of my body <laughs> and and I like that I, I enjoy the freedom that that affords me the choices that it gives me and my family members I don't have to commit to um uh, uh things if if things go really bad uh and it also gives me different perspectives on problems and solutions because I am um, thinking much more um, globally all the time. It is my nature to do so, you know, like it literally affects, you know, so, you know, I'll give you an example of that. So when president, um, president Biden was just in, um, and Belfast, right, in Northern Ireland. So because of the European Union, you, you know, that visit and the promise of $6 billion if they get their poop together and and uh, and create a government that between Protestants and Catholics there, it really matters. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so important that that problem be fixed for me, right? Because... I have cousins that live in Ireland. I have cousins that live in Wales, sadly. 
not because of Brexit. I have cousins that live in London, again, sadly, but I have also cousins in Germany and in Poland, of course. And these are people I grew up with, right? Like I, I knew them. And their lives and the lives of my family are really dependent upon peace um, thriving. And anything less than that is, is you know, affects me really directly, even though it may be far away. Of course, locally, I have the same issue um, with uh, the gun deaths that um, we simply um, uh, accept here in the United States. And also, of course, the the racial social injustices, which we embrace in the United States. We embrace our um, our racism and our classism here right in and, and uh, another you know interesting being dual right being dual uh, uh having more you know traveling a lot living in europe uh living in england b- before brexit uh and you know one thing it, when you live in in england is of course what well, one is the varieties of english wow like you move like one town to the next town and you've switched versions of English, right? And these are versions of English. These are as old as any other version of English, right? And they are they are literally English, like in England, and they differ from each other to the point where sometimes you really cannot understand them using what we now consider standard English. And it's it takes you really have to tune your ear. Um and that experience uh, is amazing for an American speaker as 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 well. It was just the expansion of my understanding of English, and then of course Irish English. Uh, how that has uh, influenced. Uh, I had the good fortune of going to Loyola University of Chicago, which which has taken me a long time to say the good fortune part. Uh, but uh, I, my, you know what? I was really depressed. I, I was a very depressed undergraduate. Somebody should have helped me. Um, and maybe I blamed them for not helping me, uh, for not recognizing just how sad I was and, and how depressed I was. But I was really depressed, almost suicidal. Um, not quite. Um, but uh, they had their English department was dominated by um irish english speakers uh so so um seamus haney um gave the um commencement address at my graduation uh, i have no idea what he said uh but but i'm sure it was uh incredibly inspiring uh and beautifully and well said but you know but it is that version of english that i um certainly um came to understand and only once the e once Poland was in the EU did I understand Irish republicanism and its central role in the, in its literature and the output and in the ident the Irish identity and how powerful that was and now of course with Ireland this you know another Catholic country you know all the way on the other side of Europe but you know with a secular government with a with a secular identity with a secular political identity and the the it is the anchor around you know we talk about the french and the germans being the most important partners in the eu but the most important individual country in the eu is definitely ireland uh they're they're english speakers number one two they you know they're they are totally committed to republicanism uh and there is no there is no movement in ireland for you know like in my play right uh, a psychopath coming in and starting to um dictate uh policies right uh for 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 any reason right religious political uh political uh uh any reason you know killing is absurd it's an absurd way to <laughs> to deal with differences it doesn't solve anything in the end it just causes more hurt uh and you know the irish 
example of moving away from that again can anything be more powerful than than what is happening there and that that reconciliation that is happening and hopefully we'll continue and again stabilize um you know the the subcontinent of europe and the european union and therefore poland and then the united states so it all clicks together for me <laughs> Absolutely. I I don't even know how to respond to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot, isn't it? Um, I, I love it. I love all of it. It's I'm, fascinating. I'm so sorry that, that no, yeah, no. I'm, I'm verbosity. I was what, at Columbia University. Look, I look, I'm a you know, okay, I didn't grow up poor. My dad was a jeweler, okay? And so we grew up middle class, all right. But you know, we were immigrants. It was still the immigrant. You know, I didn't grow up in in a palace. Um, I grew up with again. You know, we tr I traveled to to Poland often. And we had a summer house, pleasant life. Again, I went to private schools all my life. Again, my my dad would pay for them, but we weren't rich. You know, uh, but then I'm at Columbia University, and some guy comes up to, like, oh yeah, we you know, and in a, it was a university shared space. So New York, very common, even middle-aged people share share living space, right? Because it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. And this guy was sharing a space. And at the end of the summer that he was sharing space, comes up to me and says, like, you know, you are one of the most conceited people I know. And I'm like, I hardly even talk to you. And he's like, yeah, just the way you speak, the words you use. I mean, it's just, you know, you're completely conceited and left. And I'm, you know, like English isn't my first, isn't my first language. Like I have learned this language. And then you're complaining that I've learned it too well. <laughs> that's, your, that's your critique. Your critique is that my skills and uh, uh, I've acquired communication skills that are more than yours. And somehow this is the conceit. Like, no, it is not the conceit. That's just who I am. I am a verbose person. Like, you have to understand. Although, I, you know, I can also be quiet as a writer, right? I mean, a writer. I sit in my room alone a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So no, funny. Yeah. No, that was definitely not a critique. I love it. I love hearing all about it. I'm just like, I have to yeah. an intelligent sounding question now. No. <laughs> no fear. No fear. What would you like to go? You know, I mean, there's different directions. We can go deeper into the play itself. We can go deeper into the play itself. We could talk about like what you're working on next if you're working on anything currently. I think we can move into that conversation if you sure can. sure absolutely and let people make their own decisions about um the night they can read it and then make up their own decisions right you're mm -hmm. absolutely right uh, uh and that's and that's of course the truest thing we can say about about anything is that you know whatever whatever the artist says about the work i'm not sure it even matters because the work will have its own life and it will be interpreted as it will be interpreted. <laughs> no, I, my control over its interpretation is it's none. That's that's exactly how much it is, right? And and so it will get reinterpreted. And I know authors often, especially like in theater, you know, they're very careful about that stuff. I'm less careful about that. I'm not as I'm not as concerned about uh, um, control over how the material itself is uh, uh, um, uh, understood by anybody. Uh, I, 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 I'm also a visual artist. Um, I do photography. And, um, oh, my God, the worst part of, the, of, of, like, putting things together or in that world is the artist statement, right? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I have to make it up. I have to make something up. Why do I make it? Because I get up in the morning. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, asking an artist why you're making it is, I, and I mean, to me, it becomes a little absurd. I don't, you know, 
why do I continue putting myself through the pain of rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection? After rejection? If you know, I mean, you, yeah, I think that would take a lot of psychoanalysis more than you know, and I don't think you have the qualifications to go there with me. Definitely not. I, I <laughs> you know, not. Why would anyone <laughs> do this, right? There is no reason. You just do it, and um, you do it because it's it's something that uh, clearly brings meaning to me to do. And I think that's as much as I can say about art making in at the core of it, right? It's just the doing of it, and it's fun, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it when other people enjoy it, of course, even more. Um, I love talking about it. I love being interviewed about it. That's wonderful. But in the end, it's the core doing because that's how I'm built, um, and, uh, and, and that's it, right? Um, that's, that's my process. My, you know, I'm my, my, uh, my 10 year old was remarking like, Oh, dad's in writing mode yesterday. So he's recognized now that there's a mode I get into. I write all over the place. I'm not very like, you know, I don't have like a place to write. I don't do that. I write in spurts. Um, so I'll have dry, I'll go like almost no, no output and then very large output. Oftentimes I have to play the game of, okay, you're going to write one sentence today, you know, lowering the bar so low that it gets me to write that one sentence down. And then of course, pretty soon I'm writing a lot, right? But then I'll fall out of that habit and other things kick in and I stop, right? Um, I am working on um, a uh, a translation of Gombrovich, the Shlup, or wedding, or or um, marriage, depending on how you translate Shlup. Uh, I'm working on a um, a screenplay with uh, um, producers in Poland and in Germany. Uh, uh, based on a book by Olga Tokarczuk, the she she won the uh, Nobel prize for literature a couple a few years ago she remains a uh, very important writer in poland and in europe in general um uh i'm looking natalie natalie portman uh interviewed olga tokarczyk recently and if natalie if you see this please call i have a script based on the tokarczyk novel and you know yeah, give me a buzz natalie uh uh yeah, yeah. Uh, I there's a funny story behind that little bit there, but I'm not going to go there. But and so I'm working with with that. That one is called uh, the Case of E.E. E., and it's a it's a coming of age ghost story set in 1918 Breslau, uh, German. I'm sorry, 1908, 1908 Breslau, Germany. Um, Breslau was now a town called Wrocław in Poland. Um, and it's a town that I have family members and many family members. In. Uh, and it's also where Old Gato Kautschuk lives. Um, I'm also working with um, uh, 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 Marie Paez uh, uh, on a, um, um, a story uh, based on uh, true events in the Indian Ocean in the, the late 18th century, uh, where a ship... Uh, surreptitiously carrying um, captives from Madagascar crashes on a desert island, a true desert island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and a uh, a new society uh, is created based on um, pirate de democratic principles. And we know this uh, because they have left artifacts behind. Artifacts like um, uh, fancy dr uh, dresses, uh, fancy uh, hair hair um, uh, devices, you know, devices for, for hairstyling, right? So what we know for sure is that it was a most, it was a female dominated society on this island and that fashion and hairstyling where um, were important elements of their life on this deserted island. Now, 
these are not people there for starving to death, correct? If you have time to 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 make pretty dresses and do hair and makeup, you're not living at a you know at a subsistence level anymore. You are successful. Uh, and so they were. And uh, so it's this fascinating tale of how this um, this culture arises and then disappears in the end, sadly. Uh, but but that's that's another one. Um, and I'm working with a comic, uh, Jaime de Leon, um, here in Chicago on a, um, a, a post-COVID comedy uh, around a, uh, um, a, a Mexican-American father having to deal with um taking over his uh his family while his wife who's a nurse um is called away as a uh, a covid um uh, what, what 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 did we call them they were essential people right yeah. and she was an essential worker and mm -hmm. so so he had to take over the family so that's those are three like film stuff film things i'm working on i'm also working on theater pieces i have a um a uh a, a a performance poetry piece with masks and music uh called um uh, trauma trauma and the language contraption and i'm trying to trying to stage that it's been hard it sounds fascinating just the title sounds fascinating <laughs> thank you um yeah, lots, lots of things going on. <laughs> yeah. That's my life, you know. Yeah, yeah. That and I've always, you know, that's just I've always been that way. If you had asked me twenty five years ago, I would have given you a list very similar, the different titles. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic, though. Whenever any of those things go out into the world, you will have to send us links so that absolutely, we can... absolutely, that would be wonderful. Um. I believe, oh, I do have one bonus question that was not on really? the list. Um, I've just been asking anyone, everyone, anyone, everyone, <laughs> um, if you could give one piece of advice to others, writer, other writers out there. Uh, well, writers. Yeah. Writerly advice. Um, you know what? Um I taught writing uh, uh, to 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 um, uh, children, so sort of grades three and three through eight for a really long time. I had a lot of fun teaching um, at that level. Uh, you get great great work out of out of uh, children. Um, good literature, good literature out of children because they don't have the the uh, the fear of it it's it it is just for fun for them right and it's also like fun to create a world they 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 do that um quite naturally um and so uh after you give them a couple of tools right and really a couple of tools is um there's there's only very few in terms of narrative right uh in terms of narrative uh the 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 there's a protagonist the protagonist wants something and um that is established up front <laughs> so your first sentence controls your entire work right because or the first few sentences because that establishes almost instantly the kind of language you're going to be using the kind of story it is the genre and uh, and there are going to be rules, and you'll follow. And everybody, those you know instinctively. What 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 your job is is to focus on the the character and their needs, and really being honest with what the character needs. <laughs> uh, and sometimes that's an interesting. That's what's interesting to discover. What is it that your character really needs? And then you work through your your piece, your narrative piece, that way from different perspectives. Right, uh, and you find the places where different people disagree. That's your drama, right? And you 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 open that up. You open up that space, and that's pretty much for 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 drama. Uh, I, I'm and, and narrative in general. Um, there's format, right, for each. The and you 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 of course you both have to you have to um, uh, appeal to to the format. Because that is, without the format, 
you the, your audience will be lost, right? Because they're they have expectations, but of course, you're also wanting to play on the expectations. So the surprises of of tweaking that. And that is of of course the the skill of a good storyteller is tweaking those expectations, right? You set them up, you deliver in some way, but you change it just enough so that it's not exactly what the audience expected. Surprise. All right. Uh, and that is a technique that you just, you, you learn, you, 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 you hone that technique, right? Uh, in terms of poetry, you know, my, my poetry background is performance. So that is where I, I, um, uh, I come from a performance poetry background. And to me, uh, poetry is uh, sound and meaning. That's it. It's it's sound and meaning. It's music. You know, it's the same as music. Um, dance, dance and poetry have a lot in common. The abstractness of it, the um, the the letting go of of narrative and allowing um, pictures um, or movements to uh, um, promote feelings. I love that. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that Thank piece you. of advice and for also be, also for being here today. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful for having me and what a what a pleasure and what a what a uh you know an opportunity to to spout um words. Uh <laughs> and and hopefully yeah, it'll it'll be uh, useful uh, you know to 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 for people to hear and to to engage with. I always open to engagement. Mm -hmm. So anytime anywhere please we'll talk more. <laughs>